Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. John Tucker sitting in for Alex Steele on Paul Sweeney. We're live here in our Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio, streaming live on YouTube as well. John, looking at that UMICH data, a little bit better than expected. And what's also interesting to me is the one-year inflation outlook. Uh, the consensus was 2.9%. It came in 27 so maybe people feeling a little bit better about inflation. And, of course, this is uh, the pulse that we take just before the election, the last one oh, that's before good point. the election. Great point. So, uh, we're going to have to put on our politics hats yes. as well. Yeah, exactly. Let's break this uh, data down with Joanne Shu. She is Surveys of Consumers Director at the University of Michigan. Joanne, it seems like some pretty solid numbers here. What is your takeaway? Over the last few months, consumers have been inching up in their level of confidence in the economy. Um, they haven't really been seeing major swings um, up or down. Um, the, a lot of people are kind of reserving judgment um, until the election, um, because for a lot of people, the trajectory of the economy depends on which candidate wins the presidential race. But what does it say about uh, the, their feelings about which way they're going to vote? Because the economy, we're told time and time again, is the number one issue. You know, consumers overall um, are, are feeling much better about the economy than they were two years ago. Um, business conditions, expectations um, are near their historical or at their historical average. Uh, so people are not feeling as dismal about the economy as they did a year ago, two years ago. At the same time, they continue to tell us how much high prices are, are weighing on their personal finances. Um, so people don't necessarily feel like they're thriving now, um, but they really have seen a quite a bit of improvement um, since, since the peak of inflation a couple years ago. Joanne, how much, if any, is the recent Fed rate cut uh, factor into these results? Uh, for consumers, they are uh, they're they're absolutely expecting they welcomed the rate cuts. Um, and when we ask people about buying conditions for large purchases like cars or homes or or durable goods, um, the those those have all improved on the wake of these rate cuts and um, and continue consumers expect that to continue going forward. We have all, over half of consumers expecting rate, further rate cuts in the year ahead. Um, so it is helping a little bit. It's not helping dramatically. Home buying conditions still near historic lows, um, but consumers absolutely welcome these rate cuts. Hey, before you go, who are the people that you survey? Are they whacked out lefties or hardcore right wingers? <laughs> All of the above. Uh, we get a random sample of American consumers. Um, we get all ages, all political stripes, um, all educational attainment levels, and it absolutely comes through in our data. All right, Joanne, thank you so much for joining us. Always appreciate checking in with you on these UMICH days. Uh, Joanne Shu, she surveys up consumers director uh, at the University of Michigan. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. It's all about the election, John. It's all about D.C. The good news for us is we got Bloomberg Intelligence people down in D.C. and their job is to figure out what's going to happen in D.C., in Congress, and how's it going to impact various industries and various markets? We actually pay them to do this stuff, uh, and they're really, really good at it. Nathan Dean uh, is our go-to person in all things Washington. He makes sense out of it all. Uh, Nathan Dean, Bloomberg Intelligence Senior Policy Analyst, uh, joins us here. Hey, Nathan, I'm sure you're getting this question a thousand times a day. What will a Harris administration look like, and what will a Trump administration look like across basically everything, and how will it impact the markets? How do you kind of synthesize that question to our clients? Yeah, so I think we're, we're, we're saying that there's four, maybe five key themes. Let's go with five for next year in terms of a Harris or a Trump presidency. And you can see where both presidencies are going to have to play out in these themes. The first is, like you just mentioned, tariffs. Now, we have a 70% chance of tariffs coming no matter what next year. It's just whether or not they are a broad tariff, like 60% on all goods coming from China, or a subsector tariff like what we've seen in the Biden administration with on automobiles, for example. Tariffs are somewhat popular, so tariffs are coming. The second is tax. The Trump era tax cuts expires at the end of 2025 for individuals. So we're going to see a robust tax debate. And specifically, you're going to see a debate on whether or not that corporate tax rate changes from 21% to something else to help pay for these tax cuts. 
You're going to see a regulation effort or a deregulation effort, depending on who you are. This is certainly important to the investment banks. You're going to see the debt ceiling return probably in the second to third quarter of next year. You're going to see a debt ceiling fight if Kamala Harris wins the presidency. And finally, a lot of people have questions on the Inflation Reduction Act because there's a lot of CapEx coming into the United States on renewable industry, for example. Will the IRA either be cemented under Harris presidency or tweaked or altered to help pay for those tax cuts under a Trump presidency? Uh, for banks, um, I go right to uh, the capital requirements under Basel III. Um, how do the candidates stand on that and how would that impact the, uh, the sector? Yeah, so you're talking about the Basel III endgame. It's a proposed rule, which, if outlined as by the Fed, would increase capital requirements for the American GSIB. So think of the Bank of America as the JP Morgans and the Citigroups around 9%. You're looking at around a 3 to 4% increase in terms of the mid sized regionals like PNC Trust. Now, if Kamala Harris wins the presidency, we think this proposal will be reproposed in the early part of next year, and they'll try and finalize it towards the end of 2025, maybe the begin beginning of 2026. And then implementation would begin the next three years after that or over the next three years. If President Trump wins, I think you're going to see the work on this just stop. And I don't think these capital requirements are ever going to be implemented, at least not within the next few years. And this is where it could actually turn global in terms of its impact. The European regulators have already implemented this. They call it Basel IV. It's already been implemented. And we've seen steps, for example, in the UK for uh, the UK regulators to delay the implementation because they're concerned the Americans are never going to follow suit. So if the American regulators say, no, we're not going to move forward with the Basel III endgame under the Trump presidency, you could see the potential start of a global race to the bottom in terms of capital as Europe begins to actually pull back some of their stuff as well. Nathan, you're down there in D uh, D.C. You're, you're knee deep in this stuff, and I know you've got great sources down there. Is there any consensus to how Congress may play out in this election or House is flipping? Are they staying the same? Or are we going to have a split type of thing? Is there any consensus? Yeah, so I think most Washingtonians think that the Republicans have a really good shot of taking the Senate. And the reason being is, is that this is not a good race for the Democrats. They're playing, they're defending 23 against 34 in state, states in total. And with Senator Joe Manchin retiring in West Virginia, most likely going to replace him with a Republican, you know, the Re Democrats are essentially going to have to run the gauntlet and have a really good night in order to keep the Senate. Now, why do we care about this? Because the Senate is, there's a filibuster in the Senate for legislation, there's no filibuster for nominations. So if Kamala Harris wins and the Senate, Republicans take the Senate, they'll be effectively be able to jam a lot of her nominees, a lot of her regulatory leadership in place for the first half of the year. If President Trump wins, he's going to be able to get a lot of his nominees in place and be able to move much quicker on a deregulatory effort. Now, when it comes to the House, polling is a little bit more difficult. You know, it's extremely tight. Our general thought is, is that whoever wins the presidency will most likely win the House. And the reason why investors should care about who wins the House is because of the tax debate that I mentioned next year, tax policy historically starts in the House. So whoever controls the House, controls the House of Ways and Means Committee, and therefore controls a very important person in Washington who's going to decide what those tax negotiations will look like next year. Uh, can I just jump back to some of the sectors, specifically with electric vehicles? Harris, uh, they would support uh, subsidies for electric vehicles or tax breaks which I find curious because Elon Musk is the guy stumping for Donald Trump at this point, and he stands to be, well, Tesla stands to be impacted quite a bit by this. Yeah, you know, we've heard anecdotally that, you know, because Tesla, pay, you know, the, the Tesla vehicle is pretty expensive, and so whether or not a $7,500 tax credit would change the buying habits over Tesla, you know, I've been talking to our autos analyst Steve Mann about this quite a bit. So there's some thought out there that Tesla is somewhat protected. We've also seen through Steve's work that some of the other automakers are looking to try and put out low cost EVs as a way to combat that. But the reason why the EV tax credit is so important is because it's part of the Inflation Reduction Act. And if you're gonna try and figure out how to pay for three and a half, four trillion dollars worth of tax cuts to extend those, you know, the IRA is certainly something they're gonna be looking at. Now, I, I think the IRA for most part is going to be cemented. It's really popular in Republican states in terms of that CapEx that's coming in and building plants. But that EV tax credit is one of those provisions that could potentially be on the chopping block to help pay for those tax cuts. Yeah, John. John, if I were elected president, my first phone call would be, get this Nathan Dean guy in my White House just to get stuff done. He knows everything. And I feel like he knows everybody. And he just, he just explains stuff so well and just gets stuff done. I Why isn't anybody talking about uh, the fiscal deficits at this point? Because I guess it's just <laughs> 
you know, it's just it's not good politics. They're not popular. It's not good politics. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. Let's step back and take a look at these broader markets here. We do have, uh, you know, some green on the screen here today. We've got the S&P up uh, 50 points. That's 9 tenths of 1%. The tech-heavy Nasdaq up about 1.5%. here. So that's good news there. Victoria Fernandez joins us. She's a chief market strategist at Crossmark Global Investments. Victoria, we had some pretty good economic data today. I know durable goods orders came in uh, better than expected. We had the UMICH uh, sentiment survey come in better than expected. If I'm the Federal Reserve, I can actually think about maybe I don't have to cut come November. How do you guys think about it over there at Crossmark? It's really been our thought process all along that we would only get two cuts from the September through the December meetings. We thought we would get a 25 basis point cut in September. They would skip November and then we would get another 25 in December. For the exact reasons that you're talking about, we've seen some of the growth components of the economy continue to do pretty well. I mean, you look back at the end of August, the city economic surprise index was one of the worst levels it's been in years, but it has come up significantly since then. It's one of the reasons we've seen 10 year uh, treasury yields come up um, because they have a, a pretty high correlation. So I think it does give the Fed a little bit of wiggle room if they don't want to do anything the week of the election, um, because I have a feeling we probably won't know who the president is come Fed day when they're ready to um, to have their press conference. Ah, it gives point. them a little bit of cover to hold off and then maybe do another cut in December. Did uh, we get ahead of ourselves by uh, the markets by pricing Fed cuts? I think we absolutely did. It's no different than at the end of last year when the market was pricing in, what was it, six, seven uh, rate cuts by March. And we were having the conversation with clients going, there's no way that we're going to do that. The Fed has worked too hard and too long to get us to the point where we are. They're not going to start cutting that quickly. And we saw the market reprice at that point in time. They did the same thing here. I think they thought, OK, we're going to hit September. Labor market is weakening. We had that one payroll report. Was it July that really kind of unnerved the market a little bit? And the markets just ran with that. And again, here we are pricing some of those cuts out. You look at where the neutral rate is priced. A couple months ago, that neutral rate was around two and three quarters, two and a half. Now we're back up over three. We're closer to like a 3.6. So they basically cut in half the number of cuts that they're expecting over the next 12, 18 months. Um, so, yes, I think the market got a little bit ahead of itself. It's correcting itself now, which again plays into the Fed's um, hand of being able to be a little more cautious. Victoria, we're kind of in the teeth of the earnings season right now. We've had, obviously, the big banks put out some really good numbers uh, last week, and we're starting to right. see some more. What, what do you make of this earnings season here so far, and what do you think the market needs from earnings this period? So we saw expectations get really lowered, right, coming in um, to this earnings season. It's really the lowest earnings growth season that we've had since the second quarter of 23. So a little bit over a year um, and it was negative back then. We're not expecting anything negative here, but you're looking at maybe three to four percent earnings growth for the third quarter. Um, and you might say, OK, we're starting to see things come through from um, a weakening labor market. Maybe we start to see less hiring, wages are cooling off, margins are being compressed. All of that would make sense to see um, a lower earnings bar being set. But right um, going into next quarter and into the four quarters of next year, expectations are right back for double digits. So it seems like the market thinks earnings are continuing to be strong. Obviously, I don't have a crystal ball to tell us whether they will or not, but if they don't, then I don't know how we support a 22 times valuation on the equity market. So earnings better pull through if we want to see the stock market continue on the trend that it's been on. All right. So how do we what should I buy? How do we position ourselves? <laughs> <laughs> so the one thing we don't want to do is get in the way of the momentum of the market. And we know we have this kind of momentum play going right now because you're seeing yields and stocks, except for the last couple of days, yields and stocks have been trending higher together. 
But we do think you need to be a little bit guarded because there are yellow flags that are out there, whether it's, you know, Jolt's report, whether it's temporary um, hiring declining, whether it's hiring rates across the board declining, all of these different kind of yellow flags we've been seeing in the economy. So we want to have a pretty balanced portfolio. We like financials because of the yield curve we think will be re-steepening. They've gone, um, as you've mentioned, they had really good earnings, so they've gone up, maybe wait for a little pullback. Industrials are showing leadership right now versus the rest of the market. But find some of those areas that have pulled back as of late, healthcare, staples, even some of the tech names. That's where I think you need to go in and start looking. You look at a name like Cigna that we own, doesn't have exposure to Medicare and Medicaid like some of the other HMOs and has been holding its own, um, but it's had a pullback. You can go in there and even a name like Qualcomm. I think within the tech industry, we know we've got the MAG7 reporting next week. You can find some other areas within tech mm -hmm, um, right. to add some exposure. So make sure you're diversified. And we would add a little bit of fixed income to have steady nice. cash flow with yields as high as they are right now. All right, Victoria, thank you so much for joining us. Victoria Fernandez, folks, she's Chief Market Strategist at Crossmark Global Investments, joining us uh, via Zoom from Houston, Texas. She's a Houston native, born and raised in Houston, went undergraduate school at Rice, which is one of the great universities in this country. I wish I looked at Rice back then. I didn't even think about that. That would have been such a cool thing to be in Houston, Texas at Rice. Didn't even think about it. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. All right, John, one of the news stories today was a deal that's not going to happen. Tapestry's $8.5 billion deal for Capri. That's halted by a judge uh, in a big win for the Federal Trade Commission. Not such a big win for the shareholders of Capri, I might add. Deb Aiken, she is our go-to person for everything uh, luxury. Deb Aiken, Bloomberg Intelligence luxury goods analyst. Deb, I have to admit, I, I'm kind of surprised by this ruling by the judge. Uh, and I think the market is, too, judging by the big decline in Capri shares. What's going on there with this deal? I think so, too. Uh, hi. So, um, yeah, the I would say there was a 60 to 70 percent swing of expectation of this deal going ahead. And it's all about the coming together. Uh, Tapestry's eight and a half billion bid for Capri could have brought together two very big brands in aspirational luxury, aspirational fashion, entry level luxury, however you like to name uh, with coach under um, Tapestry and Michael Kors under Capri, as well as their four other brands combined. And the idea, you know, what, what was found by the judge is that actually there would be too much of an overlap and that there was a, a commission clash. So um, there's been a rule against um, the expectation when we looked at all the data sets, as well as many of us who've done the due diligence, and there were reams and reams of data taken to court, where that actually there's so much fragmentation across the space, particularly in the US, which is the biggest market for both brands, um, across so many price points, online and offline, in department stores, in own stores, that this was seen as possibly a deal that could have gone ahead. Yeah, it's just, what were the regulators afraid of? Like handbag prices would, uh, you know, there'd be a monopoly and On prices would job? go up, so I couldn't afford one? Yeah, the Absolutely. The, like, the expectation, <laughs> <laughs> the expectation um, that over time price rises um, would be seen to be taking place in the industry once the two brands were together. And it was seen that they could have 59 percent of that aspirational marketplace, which I find difficult to understand, as does you know much of the market, given that we did a lot of work on that. Um, and there is it, the, the deadline on this deal was actually the 10th of Feb, speaking to one of our specialists last night. Um, there's an understanding, of course, that, that a Tapestry will appeal, that Capri um, will follow and, and um, go along with that appeal. Um, but that actually to get the um, FTC to come up with their findings by the 10th of February, would be difficult and then an extension beyond which would be difficult and at that point of the 10th of feb it could be that the deal would break up so um you know there are still um cogs in motion taking place but the view in the market today is that tapestry a little bit is safe because the market versus when they put the offer in um two 
two years ago coming up by the time it would complete. It was actually uh, mid-2023. Um, wow. It's probably down for aspirational uh, luxury in terms of growth. We're actually in slight decline. Difficult U.S. market, very difficult China market, a particularly difficult Q2. And we haven't seen any change in Q3. And that's moved into October. You know, for China, we're probably seeing that market down 25 percent plus after a difficult couple of years. Um, and then for the U.S., very, very slow growth. Uh, and you really have to have your brand out there, visible, new design, uh, new right. innovations. Coach is doing it well under Tapestry. We're, we're just we're looking at some data from list to show that they're in the doing very well and they're brand eating up. Yep. But there there is a long way to go. All right. Uh, Deb, thanks so much for joining us, getting us up to date there. Deb Aiken, Luxury Goods Analyst for Bloomberg Intelligence. John, I think I would just walk members of the Federal Trade Commission down like Canal Street. I mean, there's like a billion of these knockoff bags all over the place. I mean, who, you know, I mean, you got to be oh, well, kidding me. I, I was tired of my belts that I bought at Kohl's falling apart after a couple of so months. I'm like, I was going to step up, go to coach. I was told by one of the retail experts, no, Massimo Dutta. Oh. And a lot cheaper. And so far, it hasn't fallen apart. Getting a little belt yeah. correspondent, John Tucker. Very good. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. John Tucker sitting in for Alex Steele. I'm Paul Sweeney. We're live here in our Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio and we're streaming live on YouTube as well. So check us out there. Uh, as well. Um, big take stories, uh, we love them here. Uh, these are really, really deeply sourced stories. They go really deep dives in some, some really interesting topics. And this one's about kind of the wealthy and some of the advantages they have in terms of uh, shielding their taxes. Justina Lee joins us here today, cross-asset markets reporter for Bloomberg News. Uh, she's based in London, joining us there via Zoom. Wealthy investors are using tax-aware long-short strategies to generate losses that can be used to offset capital gains taxes, allowing them to minimize their tax bills. I had not heard of this before, so I learned a lot reading this article. Justina, thanks for joining us here. Can you tell us what a tax-aware long-short strategy is? Yeah, sure. Um, I think most people probably, if, if you're familiar with the wealth management space, might have heard of tax loss harvesting, and that's where you sell your losing investment so that you have a capital loss to offset some of your capital gains tax bill. So tax for a long short essentially takes advantage of that same idea, except that because you have longs and shorts, it means that at any given time, even if the market is going up, you can still generate quite a lot of losses to offset kind of your capital gains tax bill. You know, maybe you want to sell your Apple stock or you want to sell your house or you kind of you want to sell your business. And so the whole idea here is it kind of gets you more losses faster. When you don't necessarily have losses is the way I think <laughs> I see this. Is that right? Right, exactly. And it, it, it sounds kind of funny because obviously you want to make money um, overall, but the, the magic of these strategies is they're still trying to make you money on the whole, but usually kind of in, in a whole portfolio, even if the portfolio is making money, there will be some losing positions there because you're holding hundreds of stocks usually in these strategies. And so the idea is like, well, you know, you, you make the best out of those losing investments. And in the meantime, you're, you're also like getting richer. And because you're saving money from not paying taxes, you can also be invested for longer. So is, and this is different from just regular tax loss selling, because I'm buying a huge basket of stocks knowing that overall, I'll probably make money, but there will be individual losers, uh, even if those are names I didn't necessarily want to own. Right. So in regular tax loss harvesting, usually you just have a portfolio of stocks that you own. But the problem with that is that over time, the market goes up. And so you run out of losses to harvest. Um, I mean, a lot of estimates say this can happen even just after a few years. And so with long shorts, because you have those shorts that's betting against some stocks, gotcha. the idea is you will always have some positions to sell. Okay, so election day is coming up, and this does kind of sort of figure into the elections because the Biden administration has proposed a taxing unrealized profits. Uh, how does this all? I haven't. I don't. I'm not sure what Kamala Harris's position is, but how does this tie in? 
Yeah, because um, I guess the, the the whole reason tax loss harvesting works is that you as the investor, you can choose when to sell your investments. And so most people, you know, just just never sell, especially because you can just, you know, pass them on to your, you know, your your kin, and then you get this, uh, the step of invasives as well. And so in order to tackle that, I mean, President Biden proposed in his budget earlier this year that he would impose a minimum tax on billionaires that would cover unrealized capital gains. And initially, Kamala Harris did say she supports that proposal in general. But more recently, I think her campaign has been um, kind of a little bit more vague about whether they would support, you know, taxing unrealized gains in particular. All right. So critics of, I guess they argue that these strategies, which are generally only accessible to the very wealthy, exacerbate wealth inequality and encourage complex tax avoiding schemes rather than encouraging investment and economic growth. Um, How does the financial services industry respond to those critics? I mean, it's all legal, right? Right, exactly. I mean, there are a few restrictions, you know, like you cannot sell a security for the tax loss and then buy it back tomorrow. Um, But yeah, I mean, generally, it's entirely legally above board. I think for a lot of critics, I mean, it just shows the problem with only taxable tax and capital gains upon realization. But the problem is, and and we've kind of seen this debate, you know, unfolding over, you know, Biden's proposal as well, that the problem is if you're taxing unrealized gains, that's kind of very hard to administer. And also some people say it will discourage investments. And so that would be a massive overhaul. And I don't think anyone's expecting that to change anytime soon. And so I think that's also why these strategies have been booming. Uh, Is the IRS gonna swoop in at some point? Uh, Congress gonna take hold of this and make changes? What's, What's happening on that front? There has been kind of a few bills in Congress over the years um, from Democrats to tax unrealized gains. And of course, you could say you could change kind of smaller things, you know, such as ending the step of basis or maybe changing the wash sale rule so that you can't. um, That's the rule that kind of restricts you from buying back the stock immediately after you sell it. But I think at the end of the day, I mean, a lot of, you know, people I spoke to for the story say, I mean, they know that it takes a long time for these changes to go through Congress. So I think most people seem pretty confident that um, there won't be any material changes that will affect these strategies anytime soon. Any any sense of how many people actually employ these strategies? It's hard to say, um, but it's it's interesting that they've actually been around for a few years now, but they've really only grown quite a bit in the last year or so. Um, so so AQR, which is sort of a pioneer here, I mean, their AUM in the strategy has almost doubled in just half a year. And like Quantino, which kind of shares some DNA with AQR, I mean, that's the only thing they do and their AUM has more than doubled this year. Um, this strategy does have higher higher minimum threshold. So you do need to kind of put in at least a million dollars. And of course, for this to be helpful at all, you need to have quite a lot of capital gain yeah. somewhere in your portfolio. So so it's quite it's for the it's for the elite. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> Justina, thank you so much uh, for this great story. Uh, Justina Lee, cross asset markets reporter for uh, Bloomberg News. Um, great big take story. You can read more of this story on the Bloomberg and at Bloomberg.com slash Big Take. This is the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast, available on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Listen live each weekday, 10 a.m. to noon Eastern, on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, Tune in, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can also watch us live every weekday on YouTube and always on the Bloomberg Terminal.